Hello, everyone. Um, so, welcome to the second online lecture of uh, the Music Information Retrieval course offered by me. And uh, I see that I have one viewer. Uh, maybe there will be a few more coming up. So uh, what I plan to do in this lecture is basically uh, provide an introduction to digital signal processing. Um, the background of the people that take this course varies a lot, especially uh, those of you who are not at the University of Victoria. So I know some of you are experienced uh, researchers in MIR and others are just beginners. Um, so this lecture is really targeting people who don't have experience in digital signal processing, uh, but at the same time you might find it interesting to see, um, uh, see how uh, I approach the problem of teaching the basics. Um, so at uh, this point I will switch to uh, screencast and uh, go over some slides and also I will uh, show some animations that hopefully uh, will help you um, get introduced to some important fundamental concepts in digital signal processing. So um, let's see. Okay, so uh, if things are working, uh, you should be uh, seeing right now uh, the slide. Yeah, so it seems to be on screen. So uh, what I'm going to talk about in this uh, particular case is uh, sinusoids and also introduce some of the notation that is used for digital signal processing. So uh, first, we'll talk a little bit about the basic concepts of time and frequency. And uh, then I will talk about sinusoids and phasers, which are really important fundamental concepts uh, in this um, particular field. So uh, the motivation uh, for this lecture is that uh, frequently the students that take this course here at the University of Victoria in Canada have no background in digital signal processing. Uh, so I always try to do a few lectures introducing some fundamentals. Uh, now, DSP is a large field and uh, even an introduction to DSP would require an entire course. Um, so what can be done in a few lectures is rather limited. So what I try to do is uh, stress intuition and also attempt to demystify some of the uh, basics of the mathematical notation used. Uh, so uh, the other thing that I would like to achieve is that there are some really beautiful mathematical ideas in digital signal processing that connect the continuous mathematics of the physical world with the discrete mathematics needed by computers. I hope this material will motivate you to learn, you more, to learn more about uh, DSP. Uh, also, I would like to mention that uh, if any of you have any questions during this uh, presentation, uh, I have, uh, you should be able to see um, on your Google Hangout, uh, I have enabled this question answer. Um, uh, application, so you can uh, post some comments there or, or some questions. Actually, just for fun, I will, just to see if anyone is listening, I'll uh, take a small break and wait to see if there's anyone uh, typing a question. Okay. Nothing showing up. All right. Well, I'll just move on <coughs> and hope that uh, you are listening and that uh, this thing is recorded. OK, so uh, let's move on. Uh, so digital audio recordings um, are uh, a, a little bit different than uh, analog recordings in analog media. Recordings in analog media inevitably degrade over time. 
However, digital audio representations theoretically can remain accurate uh, without any loss of information through copying patterns of ones and zeros. And uh, music information retrieval, when applied to audio signals, uh, digital audio signals, requires a process of distilling information from an extremely large amount of data. So uh, just to give you an idea, digitally storing three minutes of audio requires approximately 16 million numbers. And you can do that calculation. One second of audio takes uh, about 44,000 numbers and two channels in three minutes and so forth. Um, so somehow when, for example, you have a program for extracting the tempo, uh, it must process all these millions of numbers to essentially reduce all that information to a single number, which is the numerical estimate of the tempo. So the degree of uh, sort of information um, compaction is, is very high in uh, music information retrieval. So um, to understand uh, sound, we have to go uh, to understand music. We have to go back and look a little bit up at uh, sounds that we are interested in. And um, if you, uh, one way to think about it is thinking about the sound generation and perception systems of animals and how they have evolved to help them survive in their environment. So. Um, the main task, OK, so um, there we go. Uh, oh, fantastic. So a couple of uh, questions, comments. So there's uh, people in Montreal, Germany, Santa Barbara, Finland. Um, and uh, good. So what I will plan to do is, uh, while I do the lecture, uh, feel free to uh, type in some questions. And what I will do is at the end of this broadcast, I will try to answer the questions if uh, um, they're real, uh, if, if whatever, whichever ones of them are actual questions. OK, so um, now going back to the presentation, uh, what you really, a uh, perceptual system has evolved to do is identify other animals in the environment. So in, in some way, what we want to do is to generate sounds that would be distinct from the random sounds of the environment and also perceive sounds that would be distinct from the random sounds of the environment. And repetition is a key property of sounds that can make them more identifiable as coming from other animals. This could be predators, prey, potential mate, mates, but it's basically a signal that a repeated signal uh, signifies intention. Uh, therefore, animal hearing systems have evolved to be good at detecting periodic sounds and uh, sound uh, generation systems like the vocal tract of uh, human beings, but all, also all sorts of other mechanisms that animals use to generate sound, typically generate sound uh, that's periodic. And that means that it repeats. Now, um, there's something really interesting that happens uh, when we perceive sounds that repeat. So when you repeat a sound more than 10 or 20 times a second, instead of it being perceived as a sequence of individual sound events, it is fused into a single sonic event. Uh, and it, that sonic event has a property we call pitch that is related to the underlying period of repetition. So um, what's important to understand is that this fusion is something that our perceptual system does rather than reflect some underlying signal change other than the decrease of the repetition period. So the classic uh, experiment that one can do is if you run your fingers through, the, through a comb, if you move your fingers slowly, you hear each individual click. But if you move it fast, you will hear kind of a buzzing sound. And it's easy to generate, using computers, uh, examples like that. Or if you uh, hear a very fast drum roll, uh, it gets to the point where you don't hear the individual drum events, but it almost uh, reaches this stage where it uh, uh, turns into a single fused uh, pitch. So this is just a kind of tiny uh, preview of things to come, that pitch is a very important attribute in, obviously, in understanding uh, music. And we'll talk a, a, a
quite a bit about that in later parts of the course. So um, one thing that's really important to understand is that uh, the, the concept of a time frequency representation. So uh, when we listen to mixtures of sounds, including music, we are interested in some under some basic understanding of what is happening. So what we need to know is when specific sounds take place, that's time, and what is their source of origin. And their source of origin essentially comes from pitch and also another quality which we will uh, leave for now undefined, uh, which we will call timber. So um, this uh, kind of notion of pitch and time, uh, of frequency and time, or pitch and time, is also reflected in music notation, which uh, fundamentally represents time from left to right and pitch from bottom to top. So this is a score from uh, uh, the Prelude in C by Johann Sebastian Bach, written, uh, you can see it in his own handwriting. And uh, basically, time runs from uh, left to right and uh, you can see it here and then here. So those of you who uh, are familiar with music, this will make uh, perfect sense. For those of you who are not familiar with music notation, we will have a lecture later on where uh, we will cover the basics of uh, music theory. Okay, so uh, now we are interested in audio signals, and in audio signals, um, we have this idea of a spectrum. And the uh, spectrum is uh, a, a very fundamental concept in uh, digital signal processing. So uh, I'm not going to define it uh, uh, formally yet, but what, what basically we can think of is that informally complex sounds, <coughs> such as the ones produced by musical instruments and their combinations, can be modeled as linear combinations of simple elementary sinusoidal signals with different frequencies. So a spectrum shows how much each such basis sinusoidal component contributes to the overall mixture. And it can be used to extract information about the sound, such as what pitch it is or what instruments are playing. And the spectrum corresponds to a short snapshot of the sound in time and it analyzes the frequencies present during that short snapshot in time. So, uh, and it's called a frequency domain representation. So this is something that, you know, uh, a lot of people have kind of an intuitive idea. Of so you can think about it a little bit like an equalizer uh, or this visualizations that you see in uh, sound players where it shows energy in different frequency bands. And you see when there's a bass, there's a bar going up um, on the left. And when there's a hi-hat, all the bars go up, that kind of thing. So uh, later on, we will more formally uh, define what that is. So let's look a little bit at uh, a spectrum. Here is a spectrum of a tenor saxophone note uh, that I played at some point and I analyzed. And you can see at the x-axis, we have frequency. Frequencies measured in hertz or cycles per second. And as you can see, it is composed of uh, several frequencies. And they are all kind of regularly spaced. And that's a property of a, a lot of musical instruments that they produce what are called harmonic spectra, spectra where all the peaks are multiples of one uh, peak that we call the fundamental frequency. And in many cases, uh, that peak that is the fundamental frequency also uh, corresponds to uh, the perceived pitch, which is uh, the note or the sound that we hear when we listen to that particular sound. OK, so uh, this gives us just kind of a snapshot uh, in, in time. So it only deals with a short duration of the saxophone note. But what if I play a melody on the saxophone? Um, for that, we need to have something like a score where you have a notion of time and your notion of frequency. And sort of the music score for signal processing is spectrograms. So music and sound change over time. And a spectrum does not provide any information about the time evolution of different frequencies. So it is feasible to take the spectrum of an entire piece of music, and actually it's kind of entertaining. But what you get is how much of each frequency is in 
throughout the piece. So if, for example, we were to do a, a pseudo spectrum that contains notes for a piece of music, it would only and, and analyze the whole piece of music, it would give us a histogram of the different notes played across the piece without any information about the time evolution of those notes. So um, in order to capture the time evolution of sound and music, the standard approach is to segment the audio signal into small chunks. So you cut it into small pieces. These are called windows or frames, depending on the uh, paper or the book. And you calculate the spectrum for each of those short windows. Uh, the assumption is that during this relatively short period of analysis, typically less than a second, so standard sizes are uh, anything ranging from 10 milliseconds up to uh, maybe half a second, uh, there is not much change and therefore the calculated short time spectrum is an accurate representation of the underlying signal. Uh, obviously, uh, that uh, assumption is uh, more or less true depending on the actual signal under consideration. So if you have a long sustained note of a saxophone, then uh, the spectrum will remain relatively constant. But if you have a very short impulsive event like uh, hitting a drum, uh, then uh, you have to take a relatively uh, short chunk because otherwise your spectrum will include components of the signal before the drum hit and after the drum hit. So the resulting sequence of spectra over time is called a spectrogram. So um, here are some examples of spectrograms. So this is an example of, uh, again, myself playing uh, some melody on the saxophone. And uh, at the bottom, you see a plot of the time domain waveform of the signal. And at the top, you see uh, the spectrogram. And as you can uh, tell, at the bottom, maybe you can tell some information. For example, you can tell that there are distinct events. These little kind of clouds correspond to the start and the finish of different nodes. But you can't tell really any information about their pitch or, uh, or, or about the, their duration. So the spectrogram is much, uh, provides more information, more detail. You can see. Uh, the changes in pitch, so here you have um, a, a change in pitch and you can clearly see the harmonic structure. So the picture that I showed before, uh, the picture of the spectrum, is essentially one line of this spectrogram. And um, that's what you see. And if you stack them all over time from left to right, you get this uh, picture. And a lot of the work in music information retrieval will be uh, essentially ha has as a starting point these spectrograms, and then we do all sorts of processes uh, using them in algorithms. So um, I will uh, now move on. And um, also, an another thing you can do is uh, you can display the spectrum using what's called a waterfall display. And this is a real-time animation uh, where you analyze the sound and you display the spectra as, as these lines. Um, I can probably even try to run an example. So let me see if I can start SND Peak. Do I have? OK, I thought I had um, SND Peak installed in this computer, but I guess I don't. So. Um, SND Peak is a nice application that you can download from uh, if you uh, Google it, and then it, you can just uh, run it on your computer, and uh, it uh, captures the live sound from the microphone and analyzes it in real time and plots it. So this is a snapshot of running it. So uh, it, it's quite fun to do, and it's a nice way to demonstrate how spectrograms work if you are teaching. So I'll move on. Uh, after this, and um, now I'm going to go into the more, uh, slightly more technical, don't expect any uh, very deep uh, technical stuff, uh, about sinusoids and phasers. And by the end of this uh, lecture, you should hopefully have some more intuition about the notation used in digital signal processing and about uh, how uh, sinusoids 
uh, are fundamental in uh, how we think about um, time frequency analysis. So um, one question one might ask is why is DSP important for MIR? Well, um, the answer is that we're interested in audio recordings. Of course, there is quite a bit of MIR research that does not deal with audio recordings. We will talk about uh, MIR that deals with symbolic representations, MIR that deals with text, but uh, audio is obviously a, an important one. And as I mentioned, audio signals, when you represent them digitally, they basically are very large arrays of floating point numbers. So uh, in order to extract information from these uh, signals, you need digital signal processing techniques, and they are essential in, in doing that. And uh, the mathematical ideas behind DSP are quite spectacular, and unfortunately, uh, typically when you take a DSP course, uh, it sort of uh, has a, almost the opposite effect. It's usually taught in a way uh, that turns off a lot of people from the subject. So, um, for example, it is through DSP that you can understand how any sound that you can hear can be expressed as a sign, sum of sine waves. Uh, and that's a very fundamental uh, property that we will use for all sorts of things. And also, you can understand how is it possible to represent any possible sound. You know, your favorite music is can be just represented as a sequence of ones and zeros. This, uh, would seem totally magic to someone, let's say, 100 years ago, or maybe even 50 years ago. So, um, uh, so let's see how uh, this can be done. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is a large field and then impossible to cover completely. Uh, so I'll provide you some intuition, and I hope that these serve uh, as a, these ideas serve as a seed for uh, growing a long-term passion and interest for DSP. Um, I will also, I, I al already noticed that there was a question at the, um, uh, at the question and answer section for this lecture, um, which is asking about good books for DSP. So I have some recommendations, and I will add a couple more in the book and also make a post on the Google Plus community. So uh, there's definitely uh, a lot of books on DSP and it's hard to sort of choose where to start, but I will just give you my own personal uh, favorites later on. Okay, so um, moving on. So let's uh, uh, start our exposition with discussing sinusoids, which are elementary signals that are crucial in understanding both DSP concepts and the mathematical notation used to understand them. And our ultimate goal of the DSP lectures is to make equations such as the equation you see uh, less intimidating and more meaningful. So uh, for I, I know from my experience that a lot of students uh, might know what a spectrum is and might even use spectra uh, for a while, but then when they see this definition, this is the definition of um, the Fourier transform, uh, it, it really looks perplexing. And uh, uh, even uh, students that have taken DSP frequently just treat these equations as sort of a secret language and manipulate them in assignments and whatnot, but don't have really a good intu intuition about what's happening. Uh, what is this E? What is this J? Uh, how does it all make sense? Uh, and I, I, I had the same experience when I was uh, an undergraduate student. I took courses in DSP and I did well in them and I used DSP in my work, but a lot of the things that I did, I felt that I didn't really understand them so well. Uh, so over time I have tried to, uh, I figured out some things, so that's what I'm trying to share with you and hopefully you will find it interesting. Okay, so uh, let's move on. So what is a sinusoid? So a sinusoid is a, a family of elementary signals that have a particular shape, pattern, or repetition. So um, uh, the sine and the cosine uh, functions are particular examples of sinusoids. The general sinusoid can be described by uh, the equation that you see. So x of t equals sine of omega times t plus phi. 
where omega is the frequency and phi is the phase. And um, so one way to think of it is that out of all the possible, let's say, infinite continuous functions, uh, there is a subset of those infinite continuous functions that are periodic, and out of that subset, there is a subset that is the sinusoid family, and each member of that family is characterized by three numbers, the amplitude, uh, the frequency, and the phase. Actually, this equation here does not contain the amplitude. If the amplitude would be a alpha uh, that scales the value of the sine wave. It's just a scaling factor. So uh, most of you are familiar with um, sine waves and cosine waves, so um, I assume you, uh, this makes sense. The, the important thing to remember is that any particular member of that family is characterized by three numbers. If I give you an amplitude and frequency and phase, I have given you all the information you need to completely characterize a particular uh, sinusoidal signal. And uh, a subfamily of sinusoids that will be of particular interest are all the sinusoids or, that share a particular frequency. So if I say all the, sine uh, all the sinusoid signals that have a frequency of uh, 4, 4, 440 hertz or something like that, uh, they will all differ by amplitude and phase, but they will all have the same period of repetition. So um, here is an example uh, that shows some simple sinusoids. So S1 is a particular sinusoid, and you see it has that kind of simple oscillation shape. S2 is a sinusoid that has a slightly um, higher frequency, and also it has a different range. Uh, here the scales are different, so you don't see it so well. But here I have plotted both of them overlapping, and you can see that the green one is uh, about half the size, maybe two-thirds of the size of the blue one. And uh, what we are interested in is also, what we will find out is that we can do all sorts of interesting things by adding sinusoids. So I show you the addition, and you can see even in this simple example that just by adding those sinusoids we get this cool-looking uh, vibration shape uh, that looks like the ears of Batman or something. So um, you you get this, um, uh, you can get all sorts of interesting combinations and in fact you can approximate any periodic signal by just combining these simple shapes. A pretty remarkable uh, result that's not at all intuitive, at least uh, for me, just by looking at them. Okay, so uh, moving on. So we will motivate these sinusoidal shapes, these elementary signals, through four viewpoints. So the first viewpoint is as a solution to the differential equations that describe simple systems of vibration. So if you try to model uh, a simple vibrating system, so something like a tuning fork, and you use physics, uh, you come up with some equations, and these equations describe what, how this um, vibration evolves, and uh, it turns out that if you, short, if you solve for that equation, uh, what you get is you get a sinusoidal signal. The other uh, thing that's really uh, an important property of sinusoids is that they pass unchanged through uh, LTI systems. So LTI systems are linear, time invariant systems, and we will define to some extent what is an LTI system. And uh, what happens is that if you feed uh, uh, an LTI system a sinusoid, what comes out is a sinusoid. So you can't change a sinusoid through an LTI system, whereas other periodic waveforms, you can change them in quite drastic ways. The the third uh, viewpoint uh, that we will use is use sound sinusoids in the form of phasers, which are rotating vectors, and that will help us provide uh, a very nice geometric intuition about DSP concepts and the notation that is used to represent them. And the last part, which is also critical and builds upon all the, uh, the other viewpoints, is as basis functions of the Fourier transform, which is a fundamental technique in signal processing. Uh, 
I just want to mention that uh, the fourth viewpoint I'm not going to talk about in this uh, lecture. It's going to be the topic of a future lecture. So uh, today we're going to talk about the first three viewpoints. Okay, so I'm moving on. So uh, if we look at a simple vibration, so consider striking the tine of a tuning fork. The tine will deform, then be restored to the original position, then inertia will make it overshoot and deform in the other direction, and the pattern will repeat. So at any particular displacement x, uh, one can apply the Newton's uh, second law, and at that particular displacement x, you will have f equals ma equals minus kx, where kx is the restoring force. It's essentially the force that pushes the metal to return to its resting position. If uh, you express the acceleration as the second derivative of the displacement with respect to time, the equation can be rewritten as this for, and this equation is a differential equation that says that whatever the signal that we use, whatever the signal that produces the vibration, if it obeys the physics, what it should do is it should be proportional to minus its second derivative. Okay, so I'm not going to prove it, but what I will say is, okay, um, we are looking for a signal that satisfies the equation describing, which describes simple, simple vibrations, so we are looking for a signal that's proportional to its second derivative. And if I magically say, okay, well, I will try to use a sine wave, uh, if I plug it into the equation, you will notice that the first derivative of a sine function is a cosine function, the second derivative of the sine is minus omega squared sine, so you end up having this property that the second derivative is proportional to minus the original uh, signal. And actually that is true not only for the simple sine wave or cosine wave, but for any sinusoidal signal that uh, has an arbitrary phase. Uh, one little note that's an obvious point is that the cosine uh, is just, a, you can express the cosine as a sine with a, a phase shift uh, of pi over 2. So it's just, a, a, both of them are essentially equivalent, it's just where you start. So it turns out that sinusoidal signals arise as the solutions to the physics equations that describe simple systems of vibration that can potentially generate sound. Of course, uh, there's uh, some simplifying assumptions, like in any physical model, uh, the reality will be more complicated, the restoring force in a tuning fork might not be exactly proportional to the displacement, uh, there might be some other effects, but to a first degree approximation, uh, this is a satisfactory solution, and uh, even for more complicated systems of vibration, uh, analyzing them using uh, harmonic motion, which is the type of uh, vibration that I just described, is a good first degree approximation and can give you uh, useful information. So basically sinusoids arise from simple sound generating systems. So moving on, uh, we will talk about uh, linear time invariant systems. So systems are transformations of signals. So they take as input a signal x of t and produce a corresponding output signal y of t. So here's an example of a system. It takes the input, squares it, adds it 5, and produces a new signal. Notice that a system is sort of a, a, a process that can transform an infinite amount of values. I could give you an infinite amount of values and you can just square them, add 5, and then you get a new signal. So, um, uh, okay, so uh, L, what are LTI systems? LTI systems are linear time invariant systems, and uh, the linearity means that one can calculate the output of the system to the sum of two input signals by summing the system outputs for each input signal individually. So formally, if uh, y is the output of system 1 and y, y1 is the output of system 1 and uh, of the system for input 1, y2 is the output of the system for input 2, then 
the output of the system for the sum of the inputs is the sum of the outputs that were produced individually. So this is a very useful property because if somehow we can decompose our complex inputs into simple inputs, then we don't really have to uh, measure our system for complex outputs. All we have to do is look at how it responds to those simple inputs and then by combining the, the uh, responses we can get information. So um, you can think of uh, sine waves as sort of the ideal probe signals for understanding how an LTI system behaves. It's uh, the perfect x-ray for deciphering what a uh, linear time invariant system does. And uh, the time invariant property means that simply that the behavior of the system doesn't change over time. Basically, it, um, uh, when you shift the input, there's a resulting shift in the output, but uh, there's no other effect. So um, when a sinusoid of uh, frequency omega goes through an LTI system, it stays in the family of sinusoids of frequency omega. That is, only the amplitude and the phase are changed by the system. So an LTI system cannot introduce new frequencies. So if you have a complex signal that's a sum of sinusoids of different frequencies, uh, like, for example, the harmonic sounds that you uh, notice for the tenor saxophone, then the system output will not contain any new frequencies. It might scale some frequencies higher, scale some frequencies lower. It might change the phase, but it cannot uh, change the frequency. So the behavior of the system can be completely understood by simply analyzing how it responds to elementary sinusoids. And uh, one might ask, what are examples of LTI systems in music? So uh, not a guitar boy, a guitar body, uh, a vocal tract, the outer ear, a concert hall are, are all examples of systems that uh, can be, to some extent, approximated uh, as an LTI system. So again, like in the example of simple vibration, in a real uh, situation, the complexity of the real world is higher. So a concert hall is not going to be a complete LTI system, but it's a pretty good reasonable uh, first degree approximation and we can do a lot with that approximation. Okay, so um, moving on. The key uh, insight is uh, actually to think in circles. So in English, thinking in circles is uh, some, somewhat considered negative. Um, it's sort of you're not thinking straight. But actually, when you are thinking about DSP, it's actually way more interesting to think in circles than to think straight. So the key insight is that instead of thinking of the sinusoidal signal um, as a single-valued signal that goes up and down, like the plot that I showed you before. Instead, think of it as a rotating vector with a constant speed. So uh, here I have tried to show that. Um, I might show you an animation, uh, but I have tried to show that uh, just by these dashed lines. So this vector goes around and around and around. And it's characterized by its amplitude. The amplitude is the length of the vector. Uh, the frequency, how fast it goes around the circle, is the, the angular velocity corresponds to the frequency, and the phase is when I start measuring time. So if I start measuring time at zero, or if I start measuring time at some other angle. So uh, just for the fun of it, let me see if I can uh, play an animation. So uh, also checking some of your questions. Okay. So now I will uh, switch my screen share. Uh, now you should be able to see my face, for those of you who want to put a face on me. And uh, now I will do a screen share of, uh, let's see, what would be, uh, OK, maybe this one. OK. So. Um, so you should be able to see this. Um, oops. Uh, sorry, I apologize for the 
confusion. I have a couple of animations, and I want to make sure that I start the right one. Um, I can see that the animation is a screen, but I can't see. OK, I think this is the right one. OK, so uh, here is where you can see a rotating phaser. And um, what I have done is I have uh, plotted the projection of that rotation on the x-axis and the projection of that rotation on the y-axis. And you can see how it, um, it changes. And basically, each projection corresponds to a sinusoidal signal. So, um, so essentially, they're equivalent. I could think of it as two uh, sinusoidal signals. Uh, or I can just think of it as a rotating uh, vector on the plane. But what I will try to uh, illustrate is that by thinking it of it as a rotating vector on the plane, uh, you get some really interesting insights. OK, so now um, I will switch to uh, go back to my slides. And uh, you will probably see my face for a little bit. OK, here we go. And I will go back here. OK. So um, now, as I showed you in this animation, the projection of the rotating vector or phaser on the x-axis is a cosine wave. And on the y-axis is a sine wave. Um, so now the question becomes, how can we notate a phaser? And uh, what we're going to show is that complex numbers, which you kind of uh, typically learn just as a somewhat arbitrary thing, uh, are really a very elegant notation system for describing and manipulating rotating vectors. So first, let's review what is a complex number. So a complex number consists of two uh, real numbers, uh, where x is called the real part and y is called the imaginary part. And uh, if you are an engineer, you use j. If you are a mathematician, you use i. And that's uh, part of the notation. And we'll see how that works. And if you want to represent a sinusoid as a rotating vector, uh, then um, basically uh, any coordinate on the plane can be written as a complex number. It's uh, sort of there's this equivalence between uh, a vector and a complex number. Both have two components, two numbers. So, uh, and since I'm going to be going around in a circle with a fixed uh, angular velocity omega, if I pick a particular angle, uh, that angle will be omega times t for a particular time. So by doing the, the projections, this is the complex number that describes one particular location of that vector. Uh, for a particular time and a particular um, frequency. So um, now uh, comes this uh, idea of multiplication by j. So uh, typically, you are taught that j is the square root of minus 1, and that, that doesn't really make sense. So what the heck does square root of minus 1 mean? But if you think of it visually, uh, if you have a complex number on the plane, multiplication by j is an operation of rotation in the plane. So you can think of it as rotate 90 degrees counterclockwise. So imagine that you have a vector uh, that's the real number 1. This is a vector that would be just on the x-axis. And if I rotate it by 90 degrees, it will go fully on the imaginary axis, which will be j. And if I rotate it one more time by 90 degrees, it will go on the negative real axis. Hence, uh, multiplying j twice gives you minus 1. So uh, you can also confirm that if you take any arbitrary um, complex number, like 2 plus 3j, and you multiply it with j, the effect of it uh, is essentially a rotation uh, by 90 degrees. So this geometric viewpoint shows that there's nothing really strange or imaginary about complex numbers. They're just a nice abstraction for describing rotations. So now we will um, use that and try to develop the notation used to express uh, sinusoidal signals. 
So uh, the other thing to uh, this to talk about is complex number multiplication. So if you add complex numbers, it's basically the same as vector addition. That is, you add the x coordinates and you add the y coordinates. So the real part is the sum of the real parts. The imaginary part is the sum of the imaginary part. Where complex numbers become different from vectors is when they are multiplied. So complex number multiplication, when you taught it, is done by following the rules of algebra blindly. And then when you do the multiplication, you replace j square with minus 1 when needed. So uh, you multiply them. You get a new complex number. You have, If you have done uh, anything with complex numbers, you have done uh, exercises like that. But you don't really have an intuition. What does this multiplication do? Uh, what is its effect? Um, and where it really makes sense is if you represent the complex numbers as vectors in polar form. So when represented in polar form, complex number multiplication has the property that the magnitude of the product is the product of the magnitudes. And the angle of the product is the sum of the angles. So basically, angles have to do with rotation. So it makes much more sense to uh, have them um, work that way. And you can easily confirm that, because if you multiply something with j, the effect of it, the uh, magnitude of j is 1, uh, and the effect on the angle is basically adding uh, to the angle of the vector. And uh, also, if you multiply two real numbers, uh, then you expect that the result of the multiplication would be the same as the real number multiplication. And that's the case uh, because the magnitude of a, a real number is equal to the number itself. So this uh, property of the complex number multiplication is the underlying reason why complex numbers are a great notation for dealing with rotations on the plane. And this will sort of lead us into developing uh, an intuitive understanding of the complex number notation used for representing phasors. So um, we'll talk about a very famous formula. Uh, this is Euler's formula. And uh, the key insight, and it kind of looks confusing, and it's not that intuitive, but hopefully with this uh, visual kind of angle to it, it will become a little bit more uh, understandable. So the key insight is that the rotating vector that represents a sinusoid is just a single complex number that's raised to progressively higher and higher powers. So if you think of a complex number down, uh, then if I multiply it with itself, that will correspond to uh, a, a certain rotation. And if I multiply it with itself, it will jump to another rotation. If, I, if instead of having integer powers, I allow the power to vary continuously, what I will get is a continuously rotating number for any particular power. So um, let's use e of theta to represent a function that represents the vector at some arbitrary angle theta. Then just from geometry, we can project that vector and write it as cosine theta plus j sine theta. So uh, basically, uh, for any particular theta, I have a complex number. And that complex number will be cosine of theta plus j sine of theta. If I take the derivative of this um, equation uh, with uh, theta, then I get that the result is minus sine of theta time plus j cosine of theta, which is equal to j times e to the theta. Uh, no, sorry, j times e of theta. So um, what you end up having is basically this equation. Uh, so th this is a function for which the derivative is proportional to the original function. And from calculus, we know that, the only, that only the exponential function has this property. So we can write our function epsilon theta as e to the j theta. Uh, so if you, <coughs> uh, and, and the reason we want to do that, like we could write it anyway. We could call it uh, 
boo of theta or uh, something, but by using the exponential notation, then we can leverage all the intuition we have about how you multiply exponentials and how you uh, operate and divide them and do operations to essentially work with rotating vectors. So now we can express the fact that a rotating vector arising from simple harmonic motion can be notated as a complex number raised to higher and higher powers using the famous Euler formula. And the Euler formula says e to the j theta equals cosine theta plus j sine theta. So uh, this is really important and I encourage you to kind of uh, work through this uh, description and try a few things to uh, get a more intuitive understanding uh, because it, it provides a short notation for this pair of complex numbers. Like we could do everything just using cosine and sine, but instead we have to write less and we can do much, uh, use the, the knowledge we have of algebra to, to do all sorts of things that would be a little bit more tedious to do with trigonometry and cosine and sine. Uh, if you really don't want to, if this is starting to sound too mathematical to you, you can just view this as a funny mathematical notation for um, describing a vector that is constantly rotating. And that's all you need to remember. Okay, so um, one little bit of notation since we are talking about complex numbers that will come handy later is that uh, the definition of the complex conjugate, which is basically uh, if you have a complex number, notice now that we can write complex numbers in this form, r times e to the j theta, its complex conjugate is defined as r e to the minus j theta. So the z star is the reflection of z in the real axis. So if you had a vector going one way, you reflect it over the x-axis and it goes the other way. And we will um, see some examples of that uh, later. Okay, so um, now what did we gain from this particular way of thinking? So here's an example uh, of what you can gain. Um, so one really interesting property is that adding sinusoids of the same frequency uh, produces a sinusoid that has the same frequency. And that is not at all uh, obvious if you look at the sinusoids as plots, uh, as the usual plots. So here I have a sinusoid 1 and a sinusoid 2, which is a green signal. So suppose I gave you this particular plot, which shows them superimposed uh, on the bottom left corner, and I told you add the green and the blue. At least to my eyes, I don't see any reason why the resulting waveform should look like a sine wave. And actually, you could shift the green, you could scale the blue, you could uh, move it left and right uh, with each other, and always the addition will come up with this nice uh, shape as long as these two have the same frequency of repetition. So uh, let's try to see the same um, uh, problem uh, with our new way of thinking using phasors. Also, uh, as an exercise, uh, you can also try to do this algebraically. So you could say that S1 is equal to A1 times uh, cosine of uh, omega t plus phi1, and uh, S2 is A2 times cosine of omega t plus phi2. So you see that both of them will have the same omega but different amplitudes and phases. And then you can do a bit of algebra and trigonometry and show that the resulting sum will also have frequency omega. Instead, what we will try to rely on is the geometric intuition using phasors. So, um, the geometric view of the property uh, that sinusoids of a particular frequency omega are closed under addition is the following. The sum of two uh, vectors is, can be found from the parallelogram law. So here you see we have the blue vector and the other blue vector, and their sum is red. So if both of those vectors are rotating at constant speed, obviously the, the, the result will also rotate at the same speed. It's as if all of them are welded together in one single moving contraption 
and it goes around and around and uh, the result will stay the same. So geometrically you can sort of get Im immediately glimpse that uh, the result will, the frequency of the result will remain omega. So uh, at uh, this point I will try to show you <coughs> <coughs> an animation that uh, illustrates that concept. So I will switch uh, the screencasting and uh, here I am live and uh, here is the, so I can close this one here is what I want to show you so this is an animation illustrating that if you add two phasers that have the same frequency the resulting uh, the result of the addition is a phasor that has the same frequency. Notice that it has different amplitude and phase, but the frequency remains the same. So here we go, and you can see it go around and around, and you can see the result of the addition. I'll do it one more time. Uh, by the way, these animations will also be available at the course website, and I also, at some point when I clean it up, I will also add the code that I uh, wrote in Python to generate them. Okay, so um, now I will go back to uh, back to my Hangout. You can see me now. And uh, go back to my slides. Okay. So um, Another thing you can uh, get a nice intuition about is the concept of negative frequencies. So uh, jumping a little bit ahead, uh, later on when we talk about the spectrum and the, uh, the discrete Fourier transform, uh, we will see that the discrete Fourier transform returns a spectrum that also contains negative frequencies, but the, the negative frequencies are symmetric to the positive frequencies. If you input to the discrete Fourier transform is a real signal. So here I will show you uh, this idea. The idea is that if you have uh, one phasor going counterclockwise and another phasor that's identical going uh, clockwise, essentially what will happen is that the imaginary parts will cancel out and the real parts will be added. And so what you will have is in effect uh, canceling the imaginary component and getting a real signal. So to get a real signal out of phasors, uh, what you can do is just have two of them rotate in different um, uh, uh, different rotation in the sense of counterclockwise or clockwise and the result will be a, a real signal. And that makes perfect intuitive sense uh, in terms of negative frequency. Essentially, negative frequency means instead of rotating counterclockwise, uh, you rotate clockwise. Uh, so when you think of the sine waves as uh, values going up and down, negative frequency is somehow bizarre, but if you think of it in terms of a clock, uh, then the concept of negative frequency makes much more sense. So I will be ambitious and try to do one more. This is the last animation uh, that I will try in this um, Hangout. And um, uh, hopefully it will work. So uh, there it is. Start screen sharing. OK. So here we go. This is an illustration that if you add two phasers, uh, that have the same amplitude and frequency and one of them is going uh, clockwise and the other one is going counterclockwise uh, the result is a real signal and uh, a real sinusoid essentially. So here we go uh, and uh, one of the things that's entertaining is how our visual system uh, when you look at this it looks like when the one of them reaches the half of the circle, it bounces back and the other one bounces back uh, rather than them crossing and making a full circle, but uh, it, it's more of a visual illusion. So 
each one does a full circle and uh, one goes counterclockwise, the other one will goes clockwise. So I'll show it to you one more time. So there we go. So instead of clapping with each other, uh, they actually cross each other. Uh, okay. So uh, now I'm going to switch back to my slides. Also, I apologize for not having the animations embedded in the slides, but it's just a, a real pain to do it in a consistent way using uh, the way I write the slides, so this was uh, easier. Um, so we're almost uh, done with the main part of the lecture. Uh, actually, I We'll skip that because I don't have anything on it. This was an extra slide. Um, so there are many uh, DSP concepts that can be uh, visualized and understood nicely with phasers. Uh, so uh, it is really fun if you have the basic code for animating a phaser, which is not that hard to write in any programming language. All you need to have is the ability to um, lines and circles. Um, you can create animation similar to the ones I showed in this lecture to illustrate a couple of concepts in signal processing. So uh, one example is sim sampling Nyquist frequency and aliasing. So that you can uh, visualize as taking photographs or snapshots of the phaser as it goes around the circle. So once every, uh, every ro uh, a few times every rotation you take uh, a picture of the phaser and see where it is. Uh, another one that's nice is to look at the effects of filtering, so look at what a simple low-pass filter does to a phaser. And another one is beating, what happens when phasers are close in frequency and you plot their sum and you will see that you get the phenomenon of beating and it's quite a nice thing to see in an animation. So for those of you who like to uh, play around with things, th this would be uh, nice activities to try to do um, if you uh, have the time. So um, I also would like to acknowledge uh, uh, a large part of this exposition is uh, inspired by uh, a book that I really love and recommend a lot for people interested in digital signal processing that don't have uh, a digital signal processing background. And this is uh, a digital signal processing primer uh, with applications to digital audio and computer music by uh, Ken Stiglitz. Ken Stiglitz was one of the professors I had uh, when I did my PhD at Princeton. And he has been a huge inspiration and a mentor in many ways. And also, he was one of the people that established many of the key ideas in digital signal processing early in his career. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a good book. It's a simple book. It doesn't have a, a lot of details and uh, a, a, like many of the standard digital signal processing books uh, have uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages. But uh, it, it really cuts to the core of the topic. OK, so uh, in summary of uh, today's uh, lecture, sinusoidal signals are fundamental in understanding digital signal processing. Uh, representing them as phasers, that is vectors rotating at a constant speed, can help understand intuitively several concepts in DSP. And uh, complex numbers are an elegant system for expressing rotations and can be used to notate phasers in a way that leverages our knowledge of algebra. So I hope that uh, thinking this way makes the e to the j omega t more intuitive. And now when you uh, read some literature and music information retrieval, and there is somewhere an equation that has these uh, complex exponentials, uh, they are, look more um, familiar and not so intimidating. So in the next lecture, uh, what we are going to show is one of the key results in signal processing, arguably maybe the most important result in signal processing, that any periodic signal can be expressed as uh, a sum of these phasers. And um, that will form the basis of the discrete Fourier transform, which in turn is how 
we compute the time frequency representations that I showed in the beginning of this lecture. So the spectrograms and the spectrums are all computed uh, using that and the theory behind it is basically the fundamental idea behind it is that complex periodic vibrations can be expressed as uh, linear combinations of uh, phasers or sinusoidal signals. So uh, that concludes the slide presentation so now I'm gonna switch to a hangout mode and um, I'm gonna start uh, answering some questions. So, um, watching from Santa Barbara, not a question. Uh, what happens if we add many, many sinusoids of different frequencies together? Uh, that's an excellent question, and uh, sort of the it depends on the time scale you do it. But if, let's say, you add a lot of sinusoids with uh, similar amplitudes and different phases uh, and different frequencies, essentially what you get is noise. And um, if you look at the spectrum of noise, then that's what you see is you see that there's no dominant uh, sine wave. So that would be a, a short answer. Um, so hopefully that's uh, sufficient. Uh, there's someone in Montreal. Has the spectrum gram on slide 11 been produced using Audacity software? Yes, that is correct. I have used Audacity to produce that spectrogram. Uh, hi, watching from Finland. What is a good book for DSP? I hear that there is a Coursera course on DSP. Has anyone taken that? Uh, yes, I have taken the Coursera course on DSP. I didn't do all the assignments. I only did the first one. Uh, but I did get 100% in it. So. Um, I was happy with that. But uh, yeah, it's an excellent course. Uh, I highly recommend it. Um, in fact, uh, the way uh, the uh, Fourier transform is presented based on Hilbert spaces and kind of a geometric interpretation is also a way I like to use and it will be uh, the basis of my next lecture. So yeah, it's, uh, it is a good course. Uh, I already mentioned the uh, Ken Stiglitz book as a good uh, first book for DSP uh, and I'll provide a few other pointers. There are some nice books. The book that is associated with the Coursera book, uh, course on DSP is available for free uh, online so that's also a pretty uh, good textbook. Okay, moving on to uh, other questions. I guess that's all the questions that I see. Uh, there's one comment from uh, someone watching from the north of Germany. So uh, for those of you who are still hanging out in this hangout, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, hopefully uh, this lecture uh, helped you understand a little bit more DSP and was, uh, if you are experienced, I apologize if it was too basic. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, interacting more with you in the Google community and uh, also through the lectures. So uh, thanks a lot.